right, so I am really excited to be here. I love the city of Chicago. Um, I did just recently move to the cornfields from San Francisco, but I used to live in Hyde Park for many years, and it was a great, uh, it was a great place to live for me, um, personally. Um, and I am excited to be here because it's really important that Chicago be part of this PyData thing. Um, I went to PyData a couple of years ago in San Francisco, and uh, some of what I did there will actually be a bit tied to what I'm going to talk about today. So you're going to have talks later today on things like machine learning at scale, but I'm not going to talk about that. I'm going to talk about human learning, um, which as a professor is a little closer to what I care about. And uh, I am a brand new professor, right? I actually, this was my first week as a professor uh, here in Illinois, so um, I apologize if I'm a little sleepy. Um, right, so I do a lot of things. Um, I have various modeling and simulation projects, um, and you know everything's really computational. I don't do any um, experiments, but I'm not going to talk about any of those. All right, I'm going to talk about some of the things I do for fun and the things I've um, contributed to, and also things that have contributed to me primarily. Right, so um, I'm going to talk about something called the Hacker Within, uh, something many of you have probably heard of, software carpentry uh, spin-off called Lab Carpentry for professors who are setting up their research labs. I'm going to talk a little bit about books that are important and helpful. I'm going to talk very briefly about my research group and uh, about some work that we did at the Berkeley Institute for Data Science, which I just left uh, about a month ago. Um, but first, let me talk about my first experience here uh, at Pi Data. In San Francisco, I was invited a few years ago to be part of a um, satellite experience at Pi Data that was targeted at middle school girls, right? And the idea behind this was that um, middle school girls have just as much hunger for data intensive workflows as we do. Uh, and so a really rock star group of women were invited to Pi Data, um, I believe on the NumFocus docket, um, to teach them how to scrape the web and how to use pandas to analyze a little bit of Instagram data. And it was a total blast, and I loved it. And I had been teaching adults for quite a long time. But this, this was really awesome, and it gave me a glimpse into the future. And that glimpse was really positive and terrifying at the same time. Um, because what it showed me was that every single one of these girls uh, had hundreds, thousands of colleagues their age who also wanted to learn this stuff, and we are not ready at all to teach them. Uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about how hard it is to scale up human learning uh, based on some experiences I've had um, and, and the problem that I see. And the problem that I see right now is that the world today, as you all well know, and I'm not going to reiterate it for you because you're at the forefront of it, is that the world is extremely data intensive and computational right now. Every interaction that you have is mediated uh, with some element of computation and data spinning around us at all times. Um, and we as humans at all ages, little girls, college students, emeritus professors, everyone is clamoring to learn how to live in it properly and to make use of it. Um, and so, I'd like to talk to you a little bit about um, what I think that means for us. But I think you already know, so um, let's do a little experiment. Those of you who are sitting in front of your laptops, please take a moment away from your GitHub issues and uh, navigate to this URL, pollev.com slash Katie Huff. Uh, that's my name. Those of you with Pokemon Go machines, you can also navigate there uh, with your pocket computer. Um, and answer this question. Because I don't need to tell you what, uh, sorry, I apologize, camera people that I've just uh, jostled. Um, I don't need to tell you. You guys already know what kinds of skills are necessary in a data-intensive data computational world. What kinds of um, skills we're maybe not yet teaching. Self-directed learning. Um, see, now it's a word cloud, so it's going to look a little funky if there's more than one word, sorry. All right, mathematical thinking, rigor, computational rigor, no doubt, SQL. We're going to need some uh, learning, thinking, coding, um, all of this stuff. Communication, logic, software skills. That's right. 
Python, y'all are getting the, the hang of this, uh, statistics, uh, architectures, um, charts, books, et cetera, et cetera, right? It starts to get really serious. There's a whole lot of stuff. If you focus on the things that we're not teaching, you know, there are some interesting community issues around here. I see someone's put, uh, um, oh no, trolling, bad, <laughs> cruel, bad cr creatures. We're being serious here, but that's funny. Um, <laughs> empathy is one of them, right? That's an interesting um, contribution. Statistics is really popular. Um, I don't love word clouds, but in this, in this context, it's kind of fun to see statistics grow so large. Um, yeah, they need all of these skills, you know? Um, and we're not necessarily teaching software very well at the elementary school level. We're not, we're not necessarily teaching how to um, set up an API call from your favorite database, right? You know, grade school students don't necessarily need to know how to use an API key, but should high school students maybe start to learn that information? Like, probably, right? As soon as they start scraping the web in their college classes, um, they should have done so before. And are they doing enough web scraping in their college classes? Maybe not, right? Um, and do emeritus professors also need to learn some of this stuff? Yeah, absolutely. Now, beyond academia, I know that many of you are in actual companies, right? What does this mean for training, right? When's the last time you tried to hire someone with all these skills? How hard is that? How much do you have to offer them to show up to your company? Training people is a problem that we all face, not just me as a professor. I may be more at fault for some of the failures in training as part of the professoriate now, but um, ultimately, all of these things really need to, need to be part of it. Hacking, visualization, I love your answers. I think these are all accurate. How do you fit them into the curriculum? There's no more room. Um, anyway, so I asked a couple of other audiences what they thought. I asked, sorry, this is super teeny. Let's see if I can make it bigger. Yeah, that's the spirit. Um, so I asked the PyHPC conference this question in the context of HPC. If we want HPC skills, you know, some of them don't know how to spell math, but that's cool. Um, <laughs> but it's a great set of answers, too, that's really focused on HPC. Um, I asked a small group of other data-driven people, and they came up with practically the same answers that you did. So um, other data scientists agree with this group of data scientists. We need statistics. We need uh, pattern recognition. We need math. Um, we need distributed computing and machines, right? But what are we, how are we going to teach that? Um, so I'm going to talk to you about a couple of things that I do that are helping a little bit. I'm going to talk about a couple of things that I've seen other people do that are helping me. Uh, and then I'm going to talk about what you need to do. I have a task for all of you. So uh, there's this organization that's called the Hacker Within. Um, it's a peer-led organization for scientific computing best practices. And when I was a graduate student, I found I needed all of these skills to suddenly do research without any, without any uh, training at all. I needed to be a computational nuclear engineer. Right? I had the nuclear engineering part, um, but I was definitely expected to learn all the computing myself. Thankfully, I had a really good advisor who encouraged us to go sit together and learn it. Not alone, but together with each other. And he's great. He's one of the most interesting people, and I love him. And he encouraged us to start this uh, organization um, called The Hacker Within, where we would find the hacker within ourselves, right? Hacking skills. And we could sit together with other grad students who were struggling with stuff. This is what it looks like when the Hacker Within gets together. It's just a bunch of people with laptops talking about, you know, skills in the shell, right? Um, it started at Wisconsin, where I went to graduate school. Woohoo! Yeah, that's right. Badgers. Um, and then I moved to Berkeley, and I took it there. Um, and the University of Melbourne tried to institute it, uh, but that actually didn't work out very well. They started doing their own thing, which involved more beer. Um, I'm not even kidding. I'm not kidding at all. Um, <laughs> Michigan State tried it, uh, and it was really great, but there was a graduate student who was really pumped about it, but uh, became, uh, became significantly uh, under... Um, she, she didn't have enough uh, labor hours available to her to, to stand it up, and then a staff person tried to stand it up, and people don't want to follow a staff person into something that's supposed to be a peer-led organization, so that didn't work either. Uh, at Yale, it was another enthusiastic but overworked graduate student. Didn't work there. Uh, at the um, Swinburne Institute of Technology, Science and Technology in Melbourne, Australia, they had had experience with uh, the University of Melbourne, and they decided to start it, and it worked. Um, 
and also at the University of Illinois before I got there, a student from the University of Wisconsin Hacker Within group started there. So this group is starting up all over the place. There's now one at UC Davis. It's going well. It's not on this slide yet because it's only been like one semester, but um, I believe that they will survive. Um, and I think it's, it works because there's a community around it. Um, and we are able to teach each other important skills around a table of peers. Um, and there's no real hierarchy. People speak when they want to speak and give talks about stuff they're excited about. And no one's top down deciding what the topics should be. Um, and if you show up to the meeting, you get to push to the GitHub account. You know, it's really a maximization of permissions. Um, and there's sometimes beer, which is helpful. Uh, and this is sort of what it looks like when people get together um, with the Hacker Within. Um, and ideally, that kind of camaraderie creates a peer-driven learning and teaching. Uh, and I encourage you to think about what that would look like in your organization. You know, could you have a situation where you bring together all the mixed skill levels in your company or your new startup or your research group um, that could allow people to teach each other the things um, that they know. Because even if in mixed skill levels, you know, someone who seems to have a very high skill level in computing in general um, may lack other kinds of uh, skills. So people with lower skill levels can try to, try to normalize that by teaching even the people with higher skill levels and other things. So um, it also, you know, people love to teach each other. Uh, you know, I've found that it really appeals to people's desire to show off what they know, which is, you know, we're rarely rewarded for just knowing these kinds of computational data analysis skills until there's a plot, right? Until there's a decision made based on that data. But it's also really useful to say, you know, hey, I can make your workflow more efficient. And you, it's very rewarding. So, you know, that kind of stuff is really good. Um, we have a lot of topics. These, this is an example set of the topics from last year. Um, at Berkeley, you know, it's t Python for plotting time series, matplotlib, handling visualization, geospatial data, uh, metaprogramming, LaTeX, uh, you know, stuff like that, right? And it, it goes on and on. Um, we had some really impressive people at Berkeley that were often really excited to show off their skills. You know, we had, you know, Matthias was teaching advanced Python, right? Like, where do you get that? You know, I, Python developers teaching you how to use IPython is pretty nice. Um, I'll move on from this, but so the hacker within is a thing that you should think about um, when you think about what kinds of models have worked in other places. Uh, you should think about what's failed, maybe. Um, learn, from, learn from our mistakes. Like, don't let a single person alone who's already overworked set up the whole peer-to-peer -peer training program on their own. Be with them, help them. It takes more than one person because otherwise it'll flounder. Um, and let it be peer-to-peer -peer so people don't feel like they're being taught, that like they're having a conversation instead. Um, what else is helping? So uh, the Hacker Within doesn't scale very well it's to a room of about 30 people um, and maybe to the number of chapters that exist, uh, which is now like five. Um, but software carpentry does scale. How many of you have heard of software carpentry? Yeah, keep your hands up if you are a software carpentry instructor. That's right, we've got a couple of them. Elizabeth, raise your hand. All right. <laughs> um, so Software Carpentry is amazing. It's another num-focused funded organization, and it has been scaling really well. It takes this sort of peer-to-peer -peer learning uh, and teaching model way to its limit. Um, basically what it is, uh, here's its logo. Um, it's under the num-focused umbrella. It has now its own foundation, and it has an elected steering committee and an advisory council made up of all the people that we, uh, we think of as um, important in scientific computing education right now, frankly. Um, and uh, it's doing really well. Um, the tagline is that we make researchers in science, engineering, and medicine more productive by teaching them basic skills for scientific computing, right? Anyone who's gone through the software carpentry program is going to be slightly more hireable at your companies, slightly more attractive as a collaborator on your open source project slightly more trained to merge or pull request, right? Um, and this is what it looks like. It's a lot like the Hacker Within, but more orderly. Um, <laughs> it, they're typically these two days of workshops. Uh, scientists teach scientists, instructors are volunteers, the materials are all open source. 
Um, we no longer teach nodes, actually. I just changed it to PyTest last week, but this slide is old, sorry. Um, <laughs> we teach Bash in order to teach people to automate tasks. We teach Python to teach them to build modular code. We teach Git so that they will track and share their work. As scientists, this is actually very rare. Um, we teach SQL to manage data. Uh, we used to teach nodes, but as of like a couple weeks ago, we now teach PyTest because nodes is no longer uh, being maintained. Um, to teach people to test their code and program defensively. Are there about a million other packages we'd like to teach scientists? Absolutely. <laughs> Did most of you author one? Yes. Um, <laughs> but this is what we're teaching so that people can get the basics of how to appropriately design software. Um, there are workshops everywhere, all over the world. Uh, it's pretty amazing, um, the number of workshops that are involved here. Um, as of uh, about May of this year, we taught 500 people and, um, I mean, we taught 16,000 people and had run 500 workshops. Um, this is because we have a team of volunteers uh, and they're all over the place. Sorry, this is harder when it's zoomed in. <laughs> uh, lots and lots of instructors. And who are the instructors? Um, they're people you know, um, open source developers, scientific programmers, um, people in startups who used to be postdocs somewhere or used to be graduate students somewhere. Um, there are people like Skipper, there are uh, you know, people in this audience. And you know, I think, frankly, the reason they do it is uh, partly for the community. I don't just think that. So I used to serve on the steering committee. I was the chair of the steering committee, first one. And we asked the instructors why they do it, and this, these answers came out. Um, community, they like to travel, so these uh, workshops happen in a lot of different places, and sometimes you get the excuse to go to Italy and go teach one. Um, they often want teaching experience, because teaching is a skill uh, that is needed in the world, and um, some people teach in order to learn, right? Um, but finally, I think there's a great deal of sense need the more collaborations that you're involved in that have a different um, set of skills that, than you have, maybe uh, a diverse uh, set of stacks that people work with, maybe some people work with Mercurial and some people work with Git, some people work with Python, some people work with R, and you have all in one research group or one, one team trying to get something done, you know, um, you sense this need that everyone needs a lot, like a basic starting block. Um, off of which to work. Um, and, you know, it's, it's going really well. Like I said, there's a ton of instructors trained and a ton of workshops that have been run. We've been running workshops of various sizes all the way up to um, 150 people at once. Uh, but even this doesn't scale, right? If you're constrained to a room of 140 people and it takes three, worker, workshop, uh, it takes three instructors to train people, um, it can only scale to the level of, that it's currently scaling, and I, I'm telling you, it is at the bleeding edge of what it is capable of scaling to. If it scaled any faster, it would, it would not work. You know, and Data Carpentry is uh, another similar organization, their sister organizations, that, that's at the beginning of that scaling, you know, and, and those challenges are really serious. So, so what have we learned from this scaling? Um, you know, you can create a bottom-up grassroots organization of people like you to teach other people the things they need to know to be effective at using data and computers for their research, for decision making, for data science. Um, but we still need more. Um, and I'll tell you some things that have been helping in addition to these two organizations. Um, you've probably heard of some of them. Uh, bind, wow, this is like really zoomed in. <laughs> so there's something called MyBinder, the um, Jeff, uh, Jeremy Freeman, he's a neuroscientist. It's a, a exceptional open source project that just rent, runs a server, a cloud service for rendering interactive IPython notebooks on the browser. So this means that you can run a Jupyter notebook and change the variables and re-execute the cells without ever installing IPython on your computer. What does this mean for education? Any ideas? What's the biggest barrier to teaching a workshop? Installing the software, that first hour is so painful, even with Python, even with Conda, even with our new universe of slightly well-managed packages. The problem is that just getting someone to open a terminal and install something, or open a terminal and type Jupyter Notebook, that is a barrier. 
right, to getting them to program and getting them to play with a model, getting them to see what the data will do. And this I have used in the last week in my class, my traditional nuclear engineering class. Um, I'm teaching a classroom of 30 students how to do some nuclear engineering, right? And I can get them to try different things with a model and replot the plot with a different value for the, for the independent variable because I don't have to ask them to install anything. They can just open their browser, change the variable, press shift enter, and it's happening. So thank you to Jeremy Freeman for, <laughs> for this service. Unfortunately, it's all still running on their dime. Um, so you have to deploy it on your own servers if you want it to run uh, consistently because sometimes it's down just due to demand. Um, there's something called Lab Carpentry um, that was made up of a bunch of people who uh, um, were involved in software carpentry who are becoming researchers and leaders in their labs um, on their own. And uh, it's been really useful to me as a brand new professor and I think it would be frankly very useful to teams in the data science world because it has some hints on how to organize your lab. Um, we have a blog uh, where we're answering questions mostly targeted at people in the tenure track, but certainly of interest to people running open source development groups because a lot of it's going to be about how to you know, deal with community. Um, and there are some workshops on uh, how to train. But these organization blueprints are like templates for a website that has a code of conduct for your lab and has guides for how to start things and um, is an easy documentable um, uh, resource. All right, so there's also a neat book that John De Niro wrote that's like a nice interactive online book um, that was designed for the undergraduates at Berkeley um, who are taking their data science course, right? And I strongly encourage you guys to check it out. It's open source, it's free, and you can comment on it with Hypothesis or whatever it is you, you like. Um, if you're, was that what it's called? Um, whatever. You can, there's like metadata, uh, you're allowed to, uh, make little comments back to John De Niro through this interface. It's a nice Git book, um, and it is a really good introduction to data science. There are other introductions to data science um, that some of you have written. Andreas Mueller just is about to come out with this uh, O'Reilly book. Oh, so this book um, is called, um, it's for Data Science 8, and so it's called The Foundations of Data Science, which is the same name as the class at Berkeley. Um, so, you can get there if you go to my, and I'll show you, whoops, we're all, there we go. Um, I'll give you the link to this, this uh, at the end of the talk, which is very soon. Um, I also wrote a book. I was concerned that my graduate students would not be ready to work with me. All right, so let's get to the reality of the situation. This is my need, oops, this is my need that I'm describing to you. I, I need graduate students who are gonna push and pull to a Git repo ASAP, and I need, those people to be trained in sufficient testing that they're not going to have to have their papers retracted. Um, and I need them to be capable of interacting kindly with each other on GitHub. And uh, my friend Anthony and I wrote this book. It's a great O'Reilly book, strongly recommend it. It covers a lot of these features. Um, you know, oops, sorry. It shows you an introduction to the command line and a blast off with Python. It shows you containers, classes, and objects. It's all introduction to Python. Um, it talks about analysis, visualization, regu regular expressions. Um, it's intended for people in the STEM disciplines, in particular like the physical sciences, um, but you can see a lot of these things are useful for everyone because we're all starting at the same starting block in the universe of computing. Um, later parts are about validation and verification effectively, um, building pipelines, version controlling, debugging and testing. Um, and Documentation, publication, collaboration. We talk about Git, GitHub. Uh, we talk about Sphinx and uh, how to license your code if you want it to be open source. Um, there's a bunch of runnable IPython notebooks online um, that have been alpha tested at Simon Fraser University by Tiffany Timbers. Um, and you can find those at physics code slash seminar. So if you're curious. And this is what they look like. Here's the testing one. Um, so you can run them. You can even run them in my binder if you want. Uh, also, uh, there's new curriculum out there, and universities are trying to scale it. So books scale okay. Books scale because, you know, you can write them and anyone can buy them, and now we're scaling a little better, right? Books are great. Um, and ideally, universities will take that and teach people en masse, right? Um, and I would love to say that that seems to be working, but they are overwhelmed. 
From my experience, watching universities from the inside set up these data science programs, the demand is enormous, all right? I cannot stress this enough. The number of undergraduates who come in thinking, you know what, I'm gonna come out of this a data scientist, is terrifying. Um, Berkeley has a solution where they merge data science into core curricula so you can come out with like a data science minor. Um, and certain, some professors are equipped to teach such a class and some professors are not. And the, to the credit of Berkeley, they've been identifying the professors in the domains who are capable of doing that and encouraging them to introduce computational modules that fit within the curriculum plan that they have for these undergraduates. Um, so at Berkeley, if you've got curriculum that's, you know, running undergraduates through a pipeline like this, like now you're starting to really scale. You've got state level support for these universities, you know. And you can go further. At Illinois, there's a MOOC for a data science master's program. It's like 32 credits. Um, I don't know if it's working, but I know that it's popular, all right? I don't know what the people who come out of the end of it are like. I have not met any of them. I don't know if they're getting hired or if they have the kinds of skills that they need, but um, tons of people are interested in this. And so, you know, the question is, is it enough? Um, and I will argue to you in my last two minutes here that it's not, right? And I will tell you why. So, frankly, I learned these skills personally from people like you. I, and Jake Vanderplas, I was on a panel with him and he said the same exact thing. We were like mirroring each other. I learned these skills from the Society of Open Source, the university, if you will, of open source. I learned it from making pull requests um, and getting those pull requests rejected, right? So this is what I leave you with, right? In this universe where we've got a data-intensive computational world that people are not prepared for, but they want to be prepared. We all have to teach each other. We have to teach people who are younger than us. We have to teach people who are older than us. We have to teach people who are around us. Um, and we all have to do it in our companies, in our universities. We have to do it in our faculty meetings, <laughs> it turns out. Um, and we have to do it all the time. That's the only thing that's gonna scale. Right? You all understand parallelization. Let's parallelize this, right? And what I suggest to you, oh, sorry. Someone wants to take a picture. I will allow it because you have invited me here to speak. <laughs> all right, so I encourage you then to um, take some advice from Claude Steele, uh, who's a social scientist who studies um, implicit bias in our universe. Um, one should lower the barrier to entry. Um, never lower the standards because that's insulting. And the way to do that in the university of open source, I have some suggestions. Give your new developers some instructions. Um, document your code. Make the list host non-private. Um, make sure that the expectations for every pull request are defined clearly like in a contributions.md document. GitHub will just render it beautifully every time they try to make a pull request. Um, make sure that all the issues that would be easy for a new person are labeled low-hanging fruit. Get those people on board. Um, make sure that the permissions are given generously because people respond to respect. Uh, and make sure that it's clear how issues are accepted in your um, project. Uh, things that are a little harder, uh, you could run a sprint where you invite people to come and work on your code. But what you have to do is make sure that it's easy to build your code from source by anyone. Um, you might appoint an ambassador to new users, right? That has worked in the past for other, um, uh, for open source projects that I'm aware of. The, that person reaches out when someone seems like a brand new user or a brand new possible developer. Um, mentoring those people directly with that ambassador and maybe even hosting a conference of, of new users can get those people on board faster. So those are my suggestions for you to go out and teach all the time, incorporate it into your open source workflow and be the professors of your open source university um, because that's what's really gonna teach people. Um, thank you. <laughs>